that prayer is so familiar, isn't it? Most of us have heard it, recited it. We know it. it. We call it the Lord's Prayer or the prayer that Jesus taught. And whether we heard it in church or as a child or in a song or even written or in a book or something or in a movie, it seems like it's the prayer. It's the go-to prayer. And you know, in each of the Gospels, it's written just a little bit differently. Just as in each of our translations of the Bible, some using thee and thou and thy, and some using inclusive language, and some using debts, and some using trespasses or sins, and some putting the last phrase in about the kingdom and the glory and the power and all of that. For the most part, we find the one that means something to us, and we say it, and that's okay. We make that prayer our own. This prayer that Jesus taught is one that we should be comfortable with. Luke's version, of course, is the shortest. And you probably noticed that in the scripture reading. It just covers the basics. God, you are holy. Help us to live in a way that will bring peace. Forgive us. Sustain us. Protect us. There's not even an amen. It's pretty succinct, right? It was, in fact, such a basic prayer compared with the prayers, you know, that people had heard and memorized over the years. It was received by the crowd with a resounding silence. So Jesus does what he always does when the crowd grows silent. He weaves his words into a story. And I know that we usually make this parable about persistence in prayer that we shouldn't give up in prayer, right? That's what it's about. That maybe we can pray enough to wear God down the way the guy in the story was looking for the loaf of bread and who to serve his unexpected company who came over waking up his sleeping neighbor. Eventually, the sleeping neighbor gets up and gives him something, even though he doesn't want to, because of his persistence. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. I'm not sure I'm comfortable in God granting me my prayer request because I prayed hard enough. Or maybe granting it because I showed myself finally sincere enough or worthy enough. It doesn't sit well. It also doesn't sit well that God would be reluctant at all to grant my prayer request. If my child is sick, I don't want God to be sleeping when I come knocking in the middle of the night. And I don't want grumpy God answering the door because I woke him up. So maybe it's not all that meets the eye. Let's look a little deeper. It turns out that the word that we know and have translated as persistence is better translated shamelessness. Shamelessness. So the scripture would read, because of his shamelessness, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Hmm. What would it look like to come God, come to God shamelessly in prayer? So many times we go to God putting forth our best selves, don't we? Our holiest posture, our most prayerful, reverent voice when we pray. There's even a tone we use, the one that we hope God will hear, that puts us in the best possible light in God's eyes, that God might see past the screaming lunatic we project to the rest of the world and see a kinder, gentler version of us, one that might be granted forgiveness, or one whose child might be made well. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Except the illustration that Jesus gives, neither party is quiet or reverent. It's the screaming lunatic who goes to the door, right? Get up! I need bread. Somebody dropped by my house unexpectedly. I need a Sara Lee pound cake, and I know you got one in the freezer. 
Wake up! There's no pretense. This is a relationship. This is a solid relationship. This is a relationship built on knowing all and everything about the other, good or bad or ugly. It's the middle of the night, and the response the screaming lunatic gets in its shameless self is shameless as well. I'm sleeping here. The intimacy, the neighborliness of this exchange, the connectedness between them, this is built on trust and confidence and openness. Jesus says simply, ask, search, knock. Come as you are. God will give the Holy Spirit to all who ask. That's the response. God will give the Holy Spirit to all who ask. Notice Jesus didn't say, your request will be granted. Notice he didn't run to the freezer to get the cake, right? What we receive from God when we pray is the Holy Spirit. This is what we should expect from God when we pray, the Holy Spirit. That's the real answer to any prayer we can think of. Whether we're praying for our sick child or a job or that Sara Lee pancake in the middle of the night, what we really want is for God to pour spirit into our situation, to give us what we need, to show us what to do with it. Now, if our passage today stopped here, it would be enough to chew on for a week, right? But it doesn't. Luke weaves in the next story, and it's about casting out demons, specifically a person who has a silent demon. Further, the person who has the silent demon is silent themselves, unable to speak, mute. I ask today, has anyone ever carried a silent demon? something that you live with every day, something that perhaps eats away at you or plagues you, that relentlessly reminds you that it's there whether you like it or not. Sometimes I call it the stuff, right? The stuff that you haven't told anybody else, the stuff that you can't tell anybody else about, right? The secret stuff, the secret life, that's something that you wish you could get rid of or fix or crush or block out. But no matter how hard you try, you can't ignore it. I don't even think I have to name examples of this because I think we all carry our own. Amen? The only saving grace at all is that it's a secret or no one knows it's there. Well, at least that's what we convince ourselves, right? That no one knows it's there. Because you're sure that if somebody found you out, if somebody knew about this secret or this secret life or this silent demon you're carrying, whoever they are that might find out, you would be shamed beyond repair. Because you're not strong enough. Or you're not faithful enough. Or you don't carry enough faith to get rid of it. But that's the thing about a silent demon. It makes the possessed person grow silent themselves. Because as the demon inside grows stronger, that secret, that secret part of life grows bigger. And the rest of your life becomes smaller. Your voice grows weaker for fear that something somehow accidentally might slip out until you are at last mute. The more we don't talk about it, the more it retains its power and the stronger it becomes. You know, the only, the only one, like, 
when you really think about it, that can not just recognize it, but see it, is Jesus. Prayerful, Holy Spirit granted, shameless Jesus. It's how the demon gets cast out through prayerful, Holy Spirit granted, shameless Jesus. Once this person's silent demon is gone, the freed person, standing in Christ, standing with Christ, finds their voice once more. The mute person speaks. Now stop here a second and notice, when the demon's cast out, Jesus doesn't shame Jesus doesn't condemn. Jesus doesn't make the person feel bad about themselves for having that secret silent demon. As we said last week, Jesus doesn't do that. Say amen right now. Amen. Jesus doesn't do that. Amen. What Jesus does do in the, <laughs> is open the door in the middle of the night for a screaming lunatic. Silent, but screaming, yes? We know what that feels like, right? To be silent, but screaming. Jesus opens the door and gives them not only what they need, but gives them the voice to then serve others. Now think a second. It's funny, <laughs> not really. But often, when we've come to God shamelessly, in intimacy and trust and confidence, saying even the words of the Lord's Prayer, God, you are holy, help me to live in a way that will bring peace. Forgive me, sustain me, protect me. When God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us, and our demon is finally named and cast out, that's when we begin to heal and gain our voice. Sometimes, though, other people aren't ready to hear it. Amen? Sometimes people aren't ready to accept who we are for all that we are. They will try to find ways to silence us again. Depending on our silent demon, they will come up with 150 reasons why we can't live into all we are. And sometimes, more often than not, they will back those reasons up with scripture. People in the crowd that day were amazed, but some said, it's evil, it's evil. Jesus proved to us with a sign from heaven that this is not the devil's work. And guess what? After Jesus explains to the crowd, explains that evil can't undo evil, there are still some who did not accept what he said. There will always be people who will try to keep silent demons in place. And we have that in examples in all aspects of life, not just individual, from church life to community life to beyond. Yes? Our silent demons don't just plague us individually. Our societal and national and global systems and powers and ills must be cast out. We know that. But to do so means redefining the way we function as a people. Everything is different when we read about Jesus' words, evil can't cast out evil. Think about it. that we could, should, would live without violence, even good violence, necessary violence. 
No wonder the insightful people in the crowd that day denounced Jesus' healing. <laughs> of course, it shook their own silent demons. They knew that it meant turning a mirror back on their own lives, on their religious and communal life. It would mean giving up what they knew, how they functioned, their tools of oppression, their interpretation of scripture. It would mean most of all giving up power. We don't want to give up power. I don't judge them. I understand them. I am them. And I can probably gather sympathy for them if I allow it. Yet I cannot do that. Because as long as I have some kind of grief for this lost way of life that was oppressive and exclusive and power hungry and, oppression and oppressing, as long as I want to hold on to anything in scripture that I can interpret as exclusive or oppressive, I'm strengthening those silent demons instead of casting them out. I'm denying my human sibling speech instead of helping them find their voice. I'm denying the weevolution, right? That we are all interconnected and interwoven and interdependent. So I do persist. I persist shamelessly, and yes, it might take me, a, me being like a screaming lunatic in the middle of the night, going to God and pounding on the door, but I will do that gladly and shamelessly for others to be free. Will you join me? I tell you, no demon in the world will be able to drown out these words, God, you are holy. Help us to live in a way that will bring peace. Forgive us, sustain us, protect us. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is only in your awareness, it is only in your light that we can even see the demons that we have to somehow help cast out through your grace, your glory and mercy. Strengthen us to see our own demons, the things that we hide inside from one another and even things we hide from you. That we might live into all you have designed us to be. All we are in you. We trust. We knock and seek. In your mercy it is we pray. Amen.